that there's a, a um, um, gear one tests, gear two tests, gear three <laughs> tests. How fast you go? Reverse. Oh yeah, reverse test. That's <laughs> gonna be. <laughs> so test clutch. Uh, that's the topic of the hour. Um, when I came in this morning, someone came in, sat down, and said to every, everyone in, uh, in the room and nobody in particular, "What are we going to do about the tests?" And I'm here to tell you what we're going to do about the tests. So, as you saw from some of the other ex uh, presentations here, curl testing is improving. We're getting more tests, uh, more types of tests. We're getting faster tests. But of course, more tests means more data. And test clutch is a tool to make use of that data. <coughs> so, uh, I'm going to give a, a little bit of context here. You may have heard some of this in some of the other. Uh, presentations earlier, but bear with me, I'd like to, to give a, a little bit of, uh, of context for the rest of the talk. So, testing and curl uh, started in the year 2000, version 7.5, uh, with four tests, and it currently contains 1,955 tests, or test cases, and I've sort of used those terms interchangeably. Um, a, a test case is um, a big, the sort of grand angularity, like, um, uh, we're testing an FTP upload time condition uh, evaluates true. So it's, it's, it's going through a series of scenarios, setting up a curl transfer, and then running it, making sure that it does exactly what you want. There are two different sep uh, separate test infrastructures right now in, in curl. Uh, the traditional run tests one, uh, there's 1,688 tests uh, in there. And then there's the brand new one uh, running with PyTest that um, Stefan has created starting last year. And it's already up to 267 tests. Wow. Um, the Pi tests use an Apache server to do uh, sophisticated HTTP tests that the, the simple test servers that the traditional test suite just can't handle. Uh, so there's a lot more scenarios and a lot more in-depth and edge cases that you can test with that. Uh, using real Apache also helps you, uh, well, helps test curl against a, a kind of real installation, uh, the kind that you just find in the wild. Uh, so these tests, uh, as many as are possible, run automatically every time there's a, a commit to, to master and every time there's a pull request. <coughs> and there's uh, over 110 different environments that uh, run tests. Um, that's with seven operating systems and approximately 10 TLS libraries. Uh, so every change, every new push to master, results in about 140,000 tests being run. Uh, that's pretty shockingly high. And we're, we're making uh, commits constantly, about four a day on average, I believe. So you've seen this graph before already, number of test cases over time. Um, lines of code here on the right is uh, just the ones in lib, source, and include, and don't include blank lines. But you can see there's, there's a constant trend up, which is great. You can see the little uh, <coughs> uh, blip here where the, the pi tests were add, added. Uh, where is that? That was last year. I guess starting right over here, basically. Uh, you can see the, the sharp, I, I can't see the, the point on my screen over here, so <laughs> I'm squeezing my neck. The sharp uh, uh, bend up. So with, when you're running 140,000 tests uh, for a single commit, you do find, if there are issues with stability tests, that's when you'll see them. So some tests integrate uh, timeouts or delays in order to, to test new curl states uh, for example, Happy Eyeballs has a, a deliberate de delay built in before it makes a second connection. Uh, the 100 continue for posts, um, that has a, a built-in delay as well. Uh, so there are some tests that require deliberate delays in order to do that. But when you're running these tests on a, a loaded system, these delays uh, can't be predicted. They can be longer or shorter. Uh, as other processes consume that CPU, uh, the, the timing of, of uh, uh, execution of your process has changed as well, and that does uh, produce havoc in, in some tests that you could argue are not particularly well written in, in that respect. Um, some test servers mm -hmm. that the, uh, curl uses in the test suite are um, very simple and they do take shortcuts sometimes. For example, uh, the, the test server knows that this test is coming, it's going to be sending this and this and this, and so it sometimes takes a shortcut. Well, I'll just send you all the data right away instead of waiting for the next thing. Uh, things like that, so not quite uh, seemingly in real life, but it does make things uh, simpler to implement, and um, and for what it's testing, it's, it's generally fine. But once again, if, if the time changes slightly, then 
this does start becoming uh, an issue. Uh, and some tests are flaky, and we just don't know why. It's, it's really hard to reproduce some of this, uh, these failures on demand, and it's hard to, to rationalize about what could be going on there. Um, so even if we had a spurious test failure rate of not 1%, not a tenth of 1%, not one hundredth of a 1%, but one thousandth of 1%, that means statistically one of those 140,000 tests is likely to fail, and that's going to fail your entire uh, test run. The problem is the actual failure rate is closer to 4 in 1,000%. So you can see why the developers are, uh, it's, it's almost a meme now that uh, wow, my test actually went green. That's, that's an unusual situation. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. We, we don't want to, uh, to annoy developers with, with that sort of uh, experience. Um, a lot of these red PRs are, are actually fine. These are just flaky tests. And um, poor, the, the, the poor developer that created this PR <coughs> doesn't have anything to worry about. So that uh, makes a bad experience for uh, for any kind of developer, but especially for newcomers who don't have the history to understand that some of these tests aren't completely reliable. Uh, so they spend hours figuring out, okay, why does this test fail? You know, my code is, seems okay. This, the test seems completely unrelated. Why? And it, uh, it's not something we want to to encourage. Uh, waste developers' time, um, and it just gives them a bad feeling. So the development process typically uh, is. Uh, you submit a PR, so you're conveniently uh, leaving off the whole part of creating the, the, the PR in the first place. But from this perspective, you submit it, and then sometime later you check it, looking to see if it has succeeded or not. Or you get an email saying, yes, everything looks good, or no, there was a failure. Then you find there's a failure, so you go to the PR page, and you scroll down through these all lists of all these uh, test environments, trying to look for the red test line. Then you open the test log, you search through, find the failed test, and then you read the test title, or you go into the source code and try to figure out, could this failure have actually be um, a problem in my code, or is this something completely different? Waste developer time. It uh, also makes it easy to skip over actual failures. Because yeah. when, when you have a few of these tests uh, uh, failed, that, um, and, and they're, they're happening all the time, like we like to touch on app failures, because it happens frequently there, uh, then you tend to sort of skim over the app failure there, you know, it's probably just another flaky test, and, and you move on, and it's easy to, uh, to skip over an actual bad test. And there's been many cases where um, you look at, at, at the test and uh, the test history, and all of a sudden, wow, this test is, is red, and the one after it, and after it, and after it, and after it. And you go back to the first one, and uh, it looks through the, the test, and yeah, the, the PR showed up red. Uh, why was it submitted? Well, someone just missed the fact that there was a genuine failure there. And that's what CI tests are supposed to, to prevent. So it's just not working. So how do we fix this problem? Well, the obvious solution, you just fix the test, right? You got a flaky test, you go in there, and you rewrite it, and you make it not flaky anymore. Well, <laughs> easier said than done. Uh, failures are often really hard to reproduce. Uh, in many cases, they only happen on the, the CI systems, or they happen in uh, another platform that's not your platform. For example, Windows, in the experience of, uh, of Perl, typically is the platform that causes uh, more flaky tests. And we have very few uh, Windows developers, um, only one or two in this room, and actually one of them is left, I think. Uh, so there's just not the manpower and uh, the experience and people with Windows boxes on their uh, desk that they can actually try these tests on. Uh, and often they only fa fail in the CI builds. You run it locally and it succeeds. You run it again, it succeeds. You run it 100 times, it's succeeding all the time. Only in the CI do you start having um, problems. And a lot of that has to do with the CI systems just being overloaded and uh, changing the, the timing so radically compared to an unloaded developer system. And if you can't reproduce the problem locally, it's often very little you can do to actually solve the problem. So, um, even if you do dig into a problem, it's often hard to tell if it's a problem in the uh, curl itself, and this is a genuine failure that just happens in sort of, sort of edge condition, or it's a problem in the test, the way it's written, the sort of assumptions it makes. So there's almost 100,000 commented lines of code in the test harness in curl. Uh, that includes the, the test service. That's a big chunk of, of code. Um, and the test definitions, those uh, that describe what happens in the test, what run, the inputs, the outputs, there's another 115,000 lines there. So, uh, in fact, 
36% of all the lines in the, the Chrome repo, repo have to do with, with tests, uh, which is pretty significant, but it also can be a, um, a big chore to get through and try to find where is the problem. So there's even more code in the existing servers. So we use SSHD and SPanel and Apache, for example, and we sort of assume that these are all bug-free. Uh, they just work, and <laughs> if there's a problem, it has to be a <coughs> <laughs> I'm not saying otherwise, <laughs> but mm, yeah, the chances are maybe not 100% bug free. So there are, um, yeah, so even if you are finally m able to manage to reproduce a test uh, failure in your local machine, it can't always be fixed. So some tests are, are broken by design. Um, some have just make improper assumptions. Uh, and and just, just happen to work out a lot of the time, and some have extreme timing dependencies. And if you want to see uh, an example of that, uh, you can take a look at the old test 1474. It was deleted for a good reason, um, but I, I describe exactly wh what this test is trying to do. And it, it tries to, to get curl into a state where um, it, it's, it's sending several blocks of data, and then after like the third or fourth block, then it does something special. And so it's using timeouts, it's making assumptions about how, um, how much data is sent over a socket in, in one instance. So it failed on, on uh, OpenBSD, for example, because some of those assumptions are wrong. It, but it did actually um, reproduce a problem that uh, was, was found in the code. And it proved that that problem was actually fixed. Uh, but it, it's just, uh, you don't want to be having tests like that in your code and, and relying on them, uh, despite that. So there's another solution. Uh, if the test is, is causing you problems, well, you just delete it, right? Um, so if you delete the test, then there's no more issue. But of course, you don't want to do that if you have to. It reduces the test coverage. Um, and there's always a, a trade-off of the test coverage versus the reliability that you have. Ideally, you want all the tests to be 100% uh, reliable, and you want them to cover every possible scenario. And it's just an engineering trade-off. You, you can't get both. Um, another alternative would be to simply skip tests that are potentially <coughs> problematic. Uh, so we have these keywords that are added in some test definitions uh, for tests that we know have certain issues, the flaky keyword and then the, the timing dependent keyword. And we automatically skip any tests that have these keywords when you're running on the CI. Once again, the CI uh, systems are where we usually have the problems because of the, the hugely overloaded systems and um, the differences in timing and, and other problems there. So there's another solution. Uh, and this one was brought up this morning, actually. Uh, if there's a, a failed test and um, we know that sometimes there's failures, well, just run it again and maybe it'll work, right? So we could just run the whole test run uh, again, and that's possible just by clicking on a button in, in GitHub somewhere. But once again, you're, you're running these 2,000 tests over again, and any one of them could fail. It could be a different one failing that time. So this uh, would involve changing run test to um, detect when the, uh, a test is uh, failed and just try it again. Maybe try it twice more. We can configure that. Uh, but if there's a serious problem and all thousand tests are, are failing, well, there has to be some heuristics there. Um, so this would probably help, but uh, it does slow down the uh, test run when there are legitimate failures because they're, they're being rerun. Uh, and it can also hide legitimate failures. Um, sometimes there are edge cases and curl's actually doing something wrong and the test is, is showing you just showing you one every hundred times uh, that it's run. Um, but if, if no one's looked at it yet, then probably no one's gonna look at it again. And for the other reasons, it's probably better to just skip it, be tried, and uh, hope for the better next time. Uh, so this is just a, a pragmatic solution for known problem, uh, problematic environments. And the final solution is just work with what we have and deal with it. So an automated, automated problem of uh, lots of tests and lots of test failures, it begs for an automated solution. So the main problem that we're looking at, at least from the developer's perspective, since they're really the only ones who care about tests, uh, can a failed test be ignored? And you can rewrite this question as, did that test fail because of my code? Uh, and you can use the test run history of, of the failed test to predict the answer to that question and, and help the developer out. And that's exactly what uh, the primary purpose of test clutch is. So it's uh, a tool to ingest and analyze um, test results from CI systems. So I looked all around for an open uh, tool that would, 
that would do this kind of thing, but I couldn't find anything. There are lots of tools that help you with, with running tests and lots of tools for uh, creating them and, and um, uh, test frameworks, but none that I could find that analyzed what you have. And I suspect a big problem, a big reason for that is that this sort of problem is uh, it's not really an issue when you have you know, 10 test cases um, in, a, in a really small project, or even 100 potentially, uh, depending on, on the project. But um, for large pr uh, projects like this, like 140,000 tests, that's, that's nothing to sneeze at. Um, and there just aren't that many open source projects um, that, that really have an issue like this. Uh, so what Test Clutch does is it imports the test results from the, the curl CI systems. And it ports the, the test run metadata alongside the test results, things like the operating system it's running on, and uh, versions, the, the uh, dependencies that the curl has, and things like that. And it stores all this in a, a database that's queryable. Uh, so right now it slurps in the, the test results from um, all the CI systems that curl is using, out there, Azure, Circle CI, Service, and curl's own auto build system that uh, users various random users will, will send results to, and of course GitHub Actions. And it supports these test log formats, the, the run test one, of course, and PyTest and Automake as well. Uh, there used to be some Automake tests in curl, but I don't believe there are anymore. Uh, so the reason we have so many test uh, CI systems is uh, mostly to spread the load over um, these different systems. Uh, we have so many tests and so many test environments that we hit the limits of, of the free tiers of, of many of these systems. So this spreads the load a, bit, a little bit and allows more tests to run in parallel. So often uh, we'll, we'll have maybe 20 different uh, test environments, each running the test suite. Uh, and these are run in serial uh, so that the, the CI system doesn't have to allocate 20 um, boxes to run these tests all at once. It just does one, gives you one box, and lets you have it for a bit, running one at a time. So by spreading them over different um, services, then that parallelizes that. Uh, it's fairly easy to support <coughs> a new log format. Uh, there's not much involved in, in doing that. It's a little bit more work to support a new CI system. Uh, it can take up to about five API calls to get all the data that you need from the CI system. Uh, and also the metadata fields I found are not always very well documented. So you have to sort of make some tests, look at a lot of test logs, and figure out well, what does this field actually mean, and then convert it into a, a, a format that we're using in, in test clutch. So this is an, an example of, of one test run, the metadata for it um, in, the, uh, in the database. So um, you can see, let's see if I can get my cursor over here and point out some things. Uh, the, the name of the test, where is it? This is going to be hard to do upside down. But ah, <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I, I will do that. Um, so you can see the name of the test on the left, I think is where it was. Um, uh, yeah, CI job. This is the CMake, uh, MinGW, WC4, and GCC6, debug, blah, 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 blah. So I'm sure you've seen this um, <coughs> term before. It's just one, an after error test is one that typically is pretty flaky. Uh, it's using the GNU compiler. You can see the features that were enabled in this uh, run of, of the system, when the job started, um, how long it, it took, you can see it took uh, 3,141 seconds to, to go through the whole thing. That's close to an hour for a single uh, case. That's that's a long time. Uh, it shows you how loaded the system is. It should not be taking anywhere near that long in an unloaded system. Uh, yeah, etc. And at the end, you can see that in this particular case, uh, it ran um, 1,423 tests. Well, it didn't run them. It skipped 79 of them, but 1,343 succeeded and one failed. Um, in this particular case, it was test 1038 that failed and it failed with the protocol mismatch. Um, that information is stored in as well. I just default to So round duration, that's microseconds. Everything's microseconds. Yeah. I tried to use a, a common um, unit where it makes sense that it yeah. can do easier. Um, makes sense. Yeah, easier uh, analysis later. Uh, so this is the, the primary output of the program right now. So this um, is a part of the, a table showing the test results. So the name on the left. Um, the gray ones are ones that uh, have been deleted. Um, the the light, the dark, well, is it light or dark? I don't know. The more olive green is, is older tests, they're more than three days old. The, the bright green ones are, are recent. Uh, red shows you tests that, uh, or test runs, or at least the test failed. You can see the, the cursor highlighting over that, and you get a little bit more information. Uh, 
In this case, there were 872 tests that were run. One of them failed. Um, uh, you can see the, the, the permafail line, third from the bottom here. Uh, this is a test where you, know, you can see it, it succeeded at one point, and then something happened and it started failing all the time. Uh, so if you hover over that, that permafail, you'll see that uh, there were one, two, three, four, or sorry, no, if you hover over the, the flaky line on the second last one, there were four flaky tests. Um, test 1,113 1, was the most flaky, with a 3.6% flaky rate. Um, and if you click on any of those uh, um, links here, the, the test numbers, uh, these results here, then takes you straight to the, the logs on the PCI system. Um, this is um, probably pretty unreadable. Uh, it shows you the, the different metadata fields. And if you click on them, you can see all the different fields that are in the database. So here you can see that uh, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different architectures that we're running tests on, on four different uh, operating systems. Um, and you can do the same on, on all of them if you're interested. And here are some statistics on the last 90 days with the test runs. Uh, so we're running 435 uh, test uh, environments per day. Uh, we've run how many? 48 million tests in the last 90 days. Uh, the one I find interesting here is the, the time spent uh, running tests per day um, over there. 3.3 days spent every day. 3.3 <laughs> days per day. Yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome metric. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're, we're doing a lot of tests and they are taking a lot of time. And these figures actually don't even include PRs. This is just the, the runs on the, the master branch. So there are also a number of, of commands you can run if you have local access to the database. You can uh, get some reports on jobs run for a, a PR, and it tells you all, uh, the results of all the tests and um, which ones have been flaky recently. So this is super handy for developers who do get a red test. Um, this is something I want to uh, do some more work on and, and integrate it better. You can find test runs in which a particular test <coughs> failed. So if you, you found, oh, there's an issue in test 269, where else did that fail? And are there any similarities? You can just pop up, find out the test runs there. And you can find test runs um, matching any metadata field you want. If you want to find all the test runs running Wolf SSL, then you can just get a list um, over the past you know, week if you want, and you get the links and you can go look at the test logs, whatever you want. Uh, so some of these could be useful and could be turned into a, a web front end for developers uh, as well. So um, that's what, uh, yeah, the, the output of those reports that you just saw, they're all available on, on the website right now, they're all implemented. Uh, the next features here I've committed to implementing, and that is, uh, the big one is the PR <coughs> comments. So um, Test Clutch will uh, look for new PRs, and when the results come in, it will pull those in. And then it'll add a comment to the GitHub um, the PR, uh, it, uh, if, if telling if there have been any test failures and telling you whether those failures uh, have been flaky in the past, giving you a hint about maybe you can just ignore this, uh, or if there's some other uh, issue, then um, it, it can highlight that right in the, in the comment. So I think this is, is, is going to be a pretty powerful feature to, to work around some of these, uh, these test issues that don't have any other obvious workarounds. Um, yeah, so this, uh, it'll do that automatically as PRs come in. Um, right, other information that it can give you about the PR right in the comments, so it's, it's available. Uh, and there's plenty more that you could do with, uh, with the database of test failures. Um, I'm sure you guys can think of something else you can do if you have a massive database of all tests run over, uh, in curl over the past year. Um, some possibility is, is to email the developers automatically when it detects that the test is permanently failing. Just send them a little uh, polite email saying, mm, maybe you want to check your code again. Um, you can find patterns among the failing tests, like some tests, maybe test 1205 only fails on ARM processors, or maybe on a, on a Linux 6.1 kernel or something like that, or maybe only if you're compiled with client. Um, so that, that kind of thing can be done automatically. Uh, you could identify when uh, coverage starts dropping. Like uh, some tests, are, uh, a lot of tests actually are automatically skipped if there's some sort of issue in the environment. Uh, so if you see uh, that suddenly there's fewer tests being run and there's no real good reason for it, then 
can highlight that and it can let you know uh, that someone could look into this through reasoning. Um, you can also identify which CI builds have the most and least amount of, of test coverage, which jobs are running a specific test number. Again, if you, you're having issues with a test, just uh, get a list of them and, and look at them uh, as you wish. And find any test runs that match specific criteria and get a nice list right there ready for you to, to click on and, and investigate. Uh, or find tests that are, are never run. Uh, they've been committed, but for some reason, due to some bug, um, they're just not run anywhere. I, I found something manually just looking into this just a couple weeks ago. Th that's uh, a really powerful one, right? Since sometimes we add uh, conditions for tests, and then we just end up never running tests mm -hmm. that fulfills the conditions. Yeah, right? yeah they're sitting it's there. It looks done. like it should be running, and uh, they never fail. So right, we'll like the one you right? found when I did it with wrong casing or whatever it was. So no yeah. build ever had that feature enabled, so yeah. it never ran. Yeah. Um, and you can also see if, uh, um, you know, performance, if, if test runs start going a lot slower after a certain commit or a lot faster. Um, so those are just some, some examples. Speed tests across different platforms as well. Um, this might be a little bit difficult to, to rely on simply because the environment that we're running these tests in is, is not under our control and it, it's shared machines. Uh, but there, there may be some clues in there if, uh, looking at things in, in the long term. Uh, and you can also create alerts based on the test. I mentioned one or two that uh, we could do. Uh, if the failure rate overall is, is increasing, then it might be worth looking into. Or again, tests are slowing down or not being run. Uh, it being there's more flaky tests. Uh, that's something to be uh, we know about. Um, a week or two ago, GitHub suddenly started showing lots of flaky tests, and uh, no obvious reason. We didn't make any change. Turned out they changed their runners, and that messed things up. Well, we uh, something like this could have given us an early indication, and uh, with the analysis feature I was talking about, uh, it could say, okay, well, this is only happening on GitHub um, Mac OS uh, version 10.6 point whatever, uh, and then that might, would give some clues as to uh, you know what sorts of um, the failures are, and uh, yeah, just they maybe start uh, failing and continue failing. That's something we want to know. I, th I think uh, th that case that happened with macOS GitHub failures, I think something like that would really have helped us because it took a while until we realized that they have they have such a distribution of different runner versions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I, I remember looking at it, it was such a hard thing to understand why some builds work and some didn't. And it was not obvious mm -hmm. until you really, really scrutinized the details that they were actually different. And so that, yeah. yeah. That's one of those things it could have helped sort of identify. Right. So we, we, we have the, the data to do that. So yeah, it's a matter of code. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So hopefully this has given you some idea uh, of what you could do with this. Uh, maybe it's spurred your imagination and you can think of something that uh, could be done with this. And it's a massive tool of data. So why not use it? So please let me know if you, you have some ideas. So um, this link here is where the tests are, and then they're live, they're updated several times a day. Um, if, if you go there, you'll, you can tell I'm not a front-end developer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right now, it's, it's just running in a, uh, as a batch system, so it's just static reports to look at. Uh, but I do have plans to, to add some interactivity, so you can um, uh, do some uh, online queries and uh, get some data out of, out of the database there. Um, but for the moment, I'm concentrating on the, the, the PR work to get automatic PR comments, and then we'll see what happens after that. Hey Dan, I think your chicken says another story. <laughs> awesome front end. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, that's see, really see, I did not draw those chickens. My daughter drew them. So. <laughs> Still, you have them there. They're, they're great. I should get her into front end developing, actually. You know? yeah. <laughs> now, now they're talking. Why didn't I think of that? Nice idea. Could you use this to find out time of day when the CI systems are less likely to be congested. Like yeah. Saturday mornings in the US, for example, or whatever. Right, right, and exactly. Yeah, the the data is all there. The, the start time and the uh, run time is all there. So right, and can you correlate that with flakiness? Because if tests are likely to be flaky when their systems are congested, could we find that basically, could we identify if a test is flaky due to congestion in the machine? Because hmm. That's a really good point.
point, actually, because that would be a, a powerful one, time of day, and, uh, yeah, and like the U.S. holidays would be another uh, data point that could mm -hmm. be thrown in there. Yeah. Stuff like that. Uh, and then yeah. we could see if the flight heat test m could be plated due to timing, which is super sensitive to the mode of tenant machine. Right. Right. Now, that, that's a really good idea. So I'm, I'm not really a data analysis guy either. <laughs> um, so the data is there, and uh, these uh, reports that uh, are, are created, but, um, yeah, the, the someone who has a, a data analysis background and wants to dig in and figure out some sort of way to correlate these things, uh, they're welcome to, to do it. The data is put like cron-like several times a day? Exactly, yeah, right now that's how it works. So if you have a failed PR running, you have to, you can only really use that when the time has come that it has. So PR are, are not pulled in right now. It's just the, the commits on master. Okay. Uh, so uh, my idea for the PRs is to um, either pull frequently, like um, an hour or so, or uh, hook into the, the GitHub um, webhooks and, and get notification when things fail. I, I haven't really looked into the best way to do that yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, yeah, it'll, it'll pull in the, the PR data. The, the trick is going to be to figure out when all the, the tests are, have been run um, so uh, and complete. So um, GitHub, GitHub knows that, and uh, the, the data must be available in the API there. But until that happens, um, there's not that much point in, in putting in um, comments. I suppose if, if there's a, you, know, like, you could put a comment in saying, oh, well, this test has failed already, and we know it's flaky. But you know the next test that fails right at the end might be a uh, mm -hmm. not flaky, yeah. so you don't want to yeah, give you people want summary. No, uh, and doing it too early will be silly if you do a serious error anyway. So basically everything fails, and then mm -hmm. getting those early oh this is a flaky test you can ignore it. It will be just more of a unnecessary yeah. noise. Right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you want. I think we want to wait until we're all run before we say anything. But that uh, as well can take a long time. Like yes, that, we looked at that one example. Uh, almost an hour for a single test on that fair, so it, it can take hours. Yeah, hours. yeah, it can take a long time. Yeah, but it can take more than a single hour, right? Since there, uh, many of them are waiting until right, they start. Run right, serially, exactly. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I think it doesn't make sense until they're, they're all done, and, and you don't really know otherwise. Yeah, I, I think so too, because otherwise we risk just adding so much noise. Mm -hmm. um, on Debian, um, the CI we have. So one of the use cases is, is to uh, serve as a blocker for packages to migrate from non-stable to testing, right? Um, and one of the mechanisms they implemented there is, is a migration reference build. Um, but the, the interesting thing about it is that it keeps being refreshed such that we can identify false uh, negatives or failures that are caused by external factors. What, what do I mean by that? So if I upload a new version of curl and then uh, the tests fail, uh, the migration reference is constantly being rebuilt and then that might eventually fail if the cause of the failure is a dependency, for example, right? Um, now, I understand for, for curl, it's, it's a different reality, right? Because you're working at the commit level, maybe it's constant enough but maybe you can you can get benefit from this approach as well um, by being able to refresh your your reference build uh, and identify cases like this. So what what are you seeing as uh, using as a reference build? In this so you take basically you take the latest commit, but it mm -hmm. triggered it again. You constantly uh, trigger the build, so you always get a fresh exactly result. Exactly the same build, yes. the same environment. Because you might get a regression that was introduced by a dependency, which means the previous build would fail as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true too. Because in CI systems, we're using the, the LTS versions of Ubuntu most of the time, so there shouldn't be major changes to dependencies, but yeah, you know, that's for true. sure there, there are minor changes and sometimes they break things. Um, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's less likely for curl. Yeah, it, it is. I think it's I it's very rare that it's actually. But the Mac OS was one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And and also there's a couple of things that we uh, build from Git, um, from that Git head. Exactly. That that is. SSL. That is a common thing, right? Yeah. Uh, several of those that we build from people's mm -hmm. master, they mm -hmm. they break. Huh. 
sometimes people have a dot co RC. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. <laughs> I actually used the test clutch to find it. Oh well, yeah, you it's, it's it's great when you actually I can just pull up the, the current results if you want to see what it looks like now. Where is it here? Uh, check that out. Hmm. Yeah, like yeah, this, this red checkerboard it's pattern. Really it's elegant reference. Very yeah. easy to it's uh, reference to locate. So this is app layer. Oops, app layer at, at the, the, the top here. So this is where most of the, the yeah, reds are. Well. So as you move down here, um, it's this one. Azure <coughs> and then circle, there's a lot less uh, red. But some of these ones, the, the yellow ones here, are um, uh, runs that were aborted. Um, so this is a little bit curious. Mm -hmm. uh, at least one in CI systems, if it doesn't see any data for yeah. 10 minutes, I think, then it just says, oh, it's not going to come, exit. So none of the tests are taking that long, but um, when I was doing some parallel run runs, sometimes you would see 10 minute failure. Are these sorted based, uh, based on name? Or? Uh, basically based on name, yeah. 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 So these are the, yeah, there's some Solaris build. The, the issue is a uh, lib PSL is uh, needs to be updated. It's a, a bad version in the, the open solar or open CSW repository. But there's a lot less uh, color down here. It's nice and green here. So that's that's it's a good. massive amount of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we're looking at how many days here. This is well, if you look at uh, the date on one of these ones, it's it's 24th of April. So week and a half ago, something like that. Yeah. So we're looking at about a week and a half of tests. Um, is, is, is this uh, page linked somewhere in the core website? Or do I have to know the address for now? Uh, I, think, I don't think there's any links there yet. There it's should be a link new. somewhere in, in the dev, but I'm not sure we added it. Okay. Yeah. Ah, but it's in the agenda from the event. Yeah. yeah. And it is under curl.sc nowadays, so it's uh, so our official uh, test clutch site. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.